also mentioned it already this evening, that we are studying Great Awakening, the revival that took place from 1740 to 1742. Now again, just by way of quick reminder, what a revival is, it's certainly something that the Lord does. It's not something that man does on his own. It's something where the Lord pours out of his Holy Spirit in a greater measure to awaken and to convert. Uh, something we are considering this morning is it's not really something different that he does, at least um, in one sense. Uh, it's something that he does all the time, of course, working through the means. There has to be prayer, there has to be evangelism in order to reach people with the gospel. But in revival, the Lord uh, gives more, as it were, in response to prayer, and he certainly uh, uh, does more through our efforts to evangelize. He brings many more people to Christ through the work of his Holy Spirit. He advances his kingdom in this world. Now, we did consider, uh, let's say, last week, the revival of 1735, that the Lord began to work very powerfully in New England and beyond uh, in this way, that he brought about a greater concern for the things of the Lord and less of a concern for the things of the world, how people gave up the quarrels that they had been involved in, even for years, and began to um, embrace one another again. Stop, people stopped going to the taverns and instead began going to the minister's house because they were concerned for their souls. Public worship became alive. They began singing from their hearts instead of just mouthing the words. They listened intently to the preaching. They became concerned for the souls of their neighbors. Uh, God's truth, and this is something that seems to be true in, in virtually all revivals, that God's truth, even the things that they had heard before many, many times, seemed new and fresh. They never saw it in the way that they now saw it. We're going to see something of that again this evening. Souls were being converted at the rate of four per day and 30 a week in a town of 200 families. And by the way, Edwards estimated something like 300 or so were saved in that revival, although in this revival he's not going to attempt a guess, but we're talking about in a town of some 200 families and I think around seven to 800 people in his congregation. Now, since uh, widespread revivals in those days were unheard of, Edwards was asked, as you recall, to write an account, which he did in his book, Faithful Narrative of the Surprising Work of God, that was uh, edited and printed by John Geis and Isaac Watts. And as you recall, the book was very influential both in England and New England, actually used by the Lord to prepare that upcoming generation of preachers uh, to preach the gospel, not the least of which was John Wesley. And then lastly, we saw that there were certain things that each of the revivals shared in common. One of them was that they all came to places where the churches were largely asleep. A commentary on the time says that there was very little difference between the church and the world. The church had largely fallen into indifference. Now they also all came, uh, revivals that is, where the preaching had been altered somewhat to awaken and convert. The preaching went beyond believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Instead, the preaching also showed the individuals why it was they needed him. As Robert Bolton, you'll recall, notes, a man must feel himself in misery before he will go about to find a remedy, be sick before he will seek a physician, be in prison before he will seek a pardon. And so they preached the law of God. Pressing upon men's conscience, Bolton says, with a jealous, uh, jealous, discreet powerfulness, their special, principal, fresh, bleeding sins to break their hearts and bring them to remorse. As Paul also writes um, in Romans 3.20, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So again, these were, uh, these were, well, this was the situation, uh, again, the indifference of the church. These were the means, the preaching of the law and the gospel. But we need to remember that the means were only a part of the cause of the revival. The Holy Spirit was really the primary cause, and the Lord was pleased to grant him. 
Now again, we're looking at the Great Awakening, of which Edwards writes in his sermon, An Earnest Exhortation to Sinners in Zion. Now God is pleased again to pour out His Spirit upon us, and He is doing great things amongst us. Now the Great Awakening came suddenly, but it wasn't altogether unexpected. It was preceded by a long period of coldness and indifference, but as William Sprague writes in his Annals of the American Pulpit, it broke upon the slumbering churches like a thunderbolt rushing out of a clear sky. And again, yet it, it wasn't entirely, I should say, a, a complete surprise. There were several indications in 1739 that America was on the threshold of a great revival. Murray writes that the Lord had already prepared his preachers. Let's see if I have this quote. No. Hmm. He had already prepared his preachers and that a spirit of prayer was present in various churches. In some places, men were already showing the concern for the salvation of their souls, which was to become so general. Now, in this particular revival, the Lord uses uh, two men, which we're very familiar with by this time, and, and of course, that is George Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards. At the beginning of November 1739, George Whitfield, and by the way, it may surprise you to know that George Whitfield was only 25 years of age at this time had reached Philadelphia from England. Now, he was intending only to stop briefly before continuing to his orphanage in Savannah, Georgia. However, his plans changed when he met the tenants and witnessed the same power in preaching there that he had seen in England. While he was with Gilbert Tennant at uh, New Brunswick, Whitfield wrote in his journal, he recounted to me many remarkable effusions of the blessed spirit which had been sent down among them. The next day, Whitfield and Tennant went to New York, and while staying in the home of Thomas Noble, a wealthy merchant and friend of Edwards, Whitfield wrote his first letter to Edwards, dated November the 16th, 1739. He writes, Reverend Sir, Mr. Noble and the report of your sincere love for our dear Lord Jesus embolden me to write this. I rejoice for the great things God has done for many souls in Northampton. I hope God willing to come and see them in a few months. The journal sent with this will show you what the Lord is about to do in Europe. Now is the gathering time. A winnowing time will shortly succeed. Persecution and the power of religion will always keep pace. Our Lord's word begins to be glorified in America. Many hearts gladly receive it. O oh, Reverend Sir, it grieves me to see people everywhere ready to perish for lack of knowledge. I care not what I suffer so that some may be brought home to Christ. May the God of all grace give you all peace and joy in believing. May he increase you more and more, both you and your children. May you every day be feasted and built up with fresh anointings of his blessed spirit. And by your fervent prayers, may you be enabled to hold up the hands of, Reverend Sir, your unworthy brother, fellow laborer and servant in our dear Lord, George Whitfield. Now, Jonathan Edwards also shared the expectation that the Lord was about to do something gracious. In a sermon which would later become part of his book, A History of the Work of Redemption, he writes this, the Spirit of God shall be gloriously poured out for the wonderful revival and propagation of religion. The gospel shall begin to be preached with abundant, abundantly greater clearness and power than heretofore. Edwards also believed that the Lord, in order to bring this about, would bring together those elements in his plan that would advance the kingdom of heaven. He writes, God's providence may not, be, may not unfitly be compared to a large and long river having innumerable branches beginning in different regions and at a great distance one from another and all conspiring to one common issue. Now the friendship that developed between Whitfield and Edwards was certainly the joining of two such elements. We see from Edward's letter of February of 1740 that Whitfield's letter uh, was delayed as uh, Whitfield was himself uh, 
But Edwards writes this, Reverend Sir, my request to you is that your intended journey through New England the next summer, or in that journey, you would be pleased to visit Northampton. I hope it is not wholly from curiosity that I desire to see and hear you in this place, but I apprehend from what I have heard that you are one that has the blessing of heaven attending you wherever you go, and I have a great desire, if it be the will of God, that such blessing as attends your person and labors may descend on this town. Indeed, I am fearful whether you will not be disappointed in New England and will have less success here than in other places. We who have dwelt in a land that has been uh, distinguished with light and have long enjoyed the gospel and have been glutted with it and have despised it are, I fear, more hardened than most of the places where you have preached hitherto. But yet I hope in that power and mercy of God that has appeared so triumphant in the success of your labors in other places, that he will send the blessing with you even to us, though we are unworthy of it. I hope if God spares my life to see something of that salvation of God in New England, which he has now begun in a benighted, wicked, and miserable world and age, and in the most guilty of all nations. By the way, I just want to pause here for a minute. I want you to notice um, Edward's humility and his desire that if his people or the people of New England can be benefited by the preaching of someone else, that they would come and preach. He didn't want to, uh, as it were, hold on to his pulpit or be the center of attention. His desire was that the Lord would be glorified, and that's certainly, you'll see that humility in Whitfield as well. He goes on in his letter, it has been with refreshment of soul that I have heard of one raised up in the Church of England, referring to Whitfield, to revive the mysterious, spiritual, despised, and exploded doctrines of the gospel, and full of a spirit of zeal for the promotion of real, vital piety, whose labors have been attended with such success. Blessed be God that hath done it, who is with you and helps you and makes the weapons of your warfare mighty. We see that God is faithful and never will forget the promises that he has made to his church and that he will not suffer the, the smoking flax to be quenched even when the floods seem to be overwhelming it, but will revive the flame again even in the darkest times. I hope this is the dawning of a day of God's mighty power and glorious grace to the world of mankind. And may God send forth more laborers into his harvest of a like spirit until the kingdom of Satan shall shake and his proud empire fall throughout the earth and the kingdom of Christ, that glorious kingdom of light, holiness, peace, and love shall be established from one end of the earth unto the other. I believe I may venture to say that what has been heard of your labors and success has not been taken notice of more in any place in New England than here or received with fuller credit. I hope, therefore, if we have opportunity, we shall hear you with greater attention. The way from New York to Boston through Northampton is but little further than the nearest that is, and I think leads through as populous a part of the country as any. I desire that you and Mr. Seward would come directly to my house. I shall account it a great favor and smile of providence to have opportunity to entertain such guests under my roof. I am, Reverend Sir, unworthy to be called your fellow laborer, Jonathan Edwards. Perry Miller writes regarding this friendship and the effect that it would have on New England. He characterizes New England as a powder keg. Jonathan Edwards had already put a match to the fuse and Whitfield blew it into flame. Now again, this may be how it appears to the world. And certainly as we saw in the first lecture, Charles Finney, this is the way he would characterize it. You simply uh, get revival when you combine the right elements. However, Edwards would certainly give credit where credit was due, and that is to God. Edward writes, they have greatly erred in the way in which they have gone about to try this work. In judging of it from the way that it began, the instruments that have been employed, the means that have been used and the methods that have been taken and succeeded in carrying it on, we are to observe the effect wrought, and if, upon examination of that, it be found to be agreeable to the word of God, 
We are bound to rest in it as God's work. And we shall be like to be rebuked for our arrogance if we refuse so to do till God shall explain to us how he has brought this effect to pass or why he has made use of such and such means in doing it. It appears to me that the great God has wrought like himself in the manner of his carrying on this work. So as very much to show his own glory, exalt his own sovereignty, power, and all sufficiency. Really, only the Lord's extraordinary involvement in this revival can explain what we'll consider next. Religion was certainly at a low ebb. Samuel Blair, one of the graduates of William Tennant Sr.'s Log College that we looked at last time, wrote this. Religion lay, as it were, a dying and ready to expire its last breath of life in this part of the visible church. Formalism was the order of the day in spite of the revival of 1735. The greatest preachers didn't see consistent results in their ministries and were fully convinced that the success of any revival was not in their hands. They knew that the words of our Lord Jesus Christ were true. The wind blows where it wills, and you hear the sound of it, but can't tell where it comes from and where it goes. Octavius Winslow writes, the history of religious revival proves that all real spiritual awakenings of the national mind have been those in which God and not man has been the prime mover. So let's get into the revival now. More than a few months were to pass before Whitfield arrived in Northampton but by the time he did, in October 17th, or on October 17th, 1740, revival had already begun. It had struck the middle colonies in the spring and carried on into the summer. Ministers were saying, God is present in our assemblies. God's spirit came upon the preacher and the people. In those places where preaching had formerly had little or no effect, Men saw hell opening before them and themselves ready to fall in it. Murray writes, before the end of May 1740, it was being said that there was never such a general awakening and concern for the things of God known in America before. Now, when, Whit when Whitfield arrived in Boston in September, where he was to preach for 10 days, awakening certainly followed his ministry, but there had been signs of awakening before he arrived. Again, Murray writes, at Natick, a growing conviction had appeared among the people. And elsewhere, more than one minister was later to note that God was dealing personally with him at this period in an unusual way. For example, David Hall, a friend of Edwards and minister at Sutton, Massachusetts, says how in April of 1740, God humbled him with the conviction that religion was sunk down to a very low and melancholy ebb, but his feelings did not end there. He writes, Now I was again at this time filled with an encouraging persuasion that I should behold the power of religion reviving among us in the conversion of souls to the Lord Jesus Christ. Together with this persuasion, a most ardent thirst came upon me that I might gain souls for whom Christ died, to which end I longed for the sanctuary. I think he means, of course, the, to the church gatherings to preach. And from this time I had more knowledge than ever before what it means to preach with the spirit and with the understanding also, although still attended with great weakness. Now shortly after this, Whitfield went to Northampton. And we have Edward's record of what happened at Northampton in a letter he wrote to one of the ministers at Boston. After writing that there was a great and abiding alteration in the town since the great work of God in 1735, he writes that the youth were freer of revelry, frolicking, profane and licentious conversation and lewd songs than they had been in 60 years. And then he continues. And though after that great work nine years ago, there has been a very lamentable decay of religious affections, 
and the engagedness of people's spirit in religion, yet many societies for prayer and social worship, excuse me, social worship were all along kept up, and there were some few instances of awakening and deep concern about the things of another world, even in the most dead time. In the year 1740, in the spring before Mr. Whitfield came to this town, there was a visible alteration there was more seriousness and religious conversation, especially among young people. Those things that were of ill tendency among them were forborn, and it was a very frequent thing for persons to consult their minister upon the salvation of their souls. And in some particular persons, there appeared a great attention about that time, and thus it continued until Mr. Whitfield came to town, which was about the middle of October following. Whitfield describes this visit in his journal. We crossed the ferry to Northampton where no less than 300 souls were saved about five years ago. Mr. Edwards is a solid, excellent Christian, but at present weak in body. I think I have not seen his fellow in all New England. When I came into his pulpit, I found my heart drawn out to talk of scarce anything besides the consolations and privileges of saints and the plentiful effusion of the Spirit upon believers. In the evening, I gave a word of exhortation to several who came to Mr. Edwards' house. Now, Edwards had a, uh, basically arranged a program for Whitfield for the following days. First, he would speak to Edwards' own children and any others who had been invited to hear him speak at the parsonage. Then they would ride five miles to Hatfield where Whitfield would preach at the meeting house of Edward's uncle, William Williams. Finally, there would be a service at Northampton at four in the afternoon. Whitfield writes of the last service, I began with fear and trembling, but God assisted me. Few eyes were dry in the assembly. I had an affecting prospect of the glories of the upper world and was enabled to speak with some degree of pathos Again, remember that the revival affects not only the individuals that are being preached to, but also the preacher. And the preacher is able to preach with greater conviction because he can almost see with, with his eyes, although he doesn't really see with his eyes, but more with the eyes of faith, he sees the reality of the things of which he's preaching. And of course, the people sense it as well because the Spirit of God is, as we saw this morning, convincing them of these things that is the Spirit's work. So now after this, last, um, after this last meeting, he says two more sermons on the following Lord's Day ended his visit. And again, Whitfield wrote of that occasion, preached this morning and good Mr. Edwards wept during the whole time of exercise. The people were equally affected and in the afternoon the power increased yet more. I have not seen four such gracious meetings together since my arrival. Edwards also confirms that, quote, the congregation was extraordinarily melted by every sermon, almost the whole assembly being in tears for a great part of sermon time. And he adds, Mr. Whitfield's sermons were suitable to the circumstances of the town. Now, when that particular day was over, which I believe was the Lord's Day, Edwards accompanied Whitfield to East Windsor, where he was to preach to Timothy Edwards' congregation, Jonathan Edwards' father. Uh, the building was packed, and then afterwards, uh, having supper in the old family home. On Wednesday, Edwards returned home while Whitfield headed for New Haven. Now, that week, Sarah Edwards wrote to her brother, the Reverend James Pierpont, to tell him of Whitfield's visit to Northampton and to encourage him to welcome Whitfield when he arrived. And he or she writes this, it is wonderful to see what a spell he casts over an audience by proclaiming the simplest truths of the Bible. I have seen upwards of a thousand people hang on his words with breathless silence, broken only by an occasional half suppressed sob. He impresses the ignorance and not less the educated and refined. It is reported that while the miners of England listened to him, the tears made white furrows down their smutty cheeks. So here our mechanics shut up their shops 
and the day laborers throw down their tools to go and hear him preach, and few return unaffected. He speaks from a heart all aglow with love and pours out a torrent of eloquence, which is almost irresistible. Many, very many persons in Northampton date the beginning of new thoughts, new desires, new purposes, and a new life from the day on which they heard him preach of Christ and this salvation. Perhaps I ought to tell you that Mr. Edwards and some others think him in error on a few practical points, but his influence on the whole is so good, we ought to bear with little mistakes. And I, I believe the mistake she has in mind is the fact that uh, Whitfield uh, believed that you could tell if a person was converted or not, whether a minister was converted or not by his preaching. Uh, Edwards pointed out that really only God knows the heart, and sometimes we are certainly mistaken, and Whitfield accepted that, uh, that reproof and that correction from Edwards and amended his ways because apparently it did cause some people, uh, some lay preachers to begin to, uh, well, to consider their ministers as unconverted. So they began to uh, preach the word themselves and, and began to draw flocks away after them. But uh, Edwards, as I've said, uh, uh, Speaking to Whitfield about it, Whitfield corrected that and did what he could to correct whatever damage she may have done. So again, it just reminds us that no man is absolutely infallible. The only one, of course, who is, is the Lord Jesus Christ. Whitfield's sermon at East Windsor had been his sixth since he left Northampton only 48 hours earlier. Whitfield then moved on to Hartford, Wethersfield, and Middleton. On Wednesday, he preached at Hartford and Wethersfield, and on Thursday, he went to Middleton to preach. And we do have preserved for us an account from a man named Nathan Cole, who was a farmer in that region, who shows us from this account what the, uh, what the spiritual interest of the people was, was like throughout the country. It's a very interesting story. And here we have it uh, transcribed in full. Now, it pleased God to send Mr. Whitfield into this land and my hearing of him preaching, or hearing of his preaching at Philadelphia, like one of the old apostles, and many thousands flocking after him to hear the gospel, and great numbers converted to Christ, I felt the Spirit of God drawing me by conviction. Next I heard he was on Long Island, and next at Boston, and next at Northampton, and then one morning, all of a sudden, about eight o'clock, there came a messenger and said, Mr. Whitfield preached at Hartford and Wethersfield yesterday and, and is to preach in Middleton this morning at 10 o'clock. I was in my field at work. I dropped my tool that I had in my hand and ran home and ran through my house and bade my wife get ready quick to go and hear Mr. Whitfield preach at Middleton and ran to my pasture for my horse with all my might, fearing I should be too late to hear him. I brought my horse home and soon mounted and took my wife up and went forward as fast as I thought the horse could bear. And when my horse began to be out of breath, I would get down and put my wife in the saddle and bid her ride as fast as she could and not stop or slack for me except I bade her. And so I would run until I was almost out of breath and then mount my horse again. And so I did several times to favor my horse, for we had 12 miles to ride double in little more than an hour. On high ground, I saw before me a cloud or fog rising. I first thought off from the great river, but as I came nearer the road, I heard a noise, something like a low rumbling of horses' feet coming down the road. And this cloud was a cloud of dust made by the running of horses' feet. It arose some rods in the air over the tops of the hills and trees. And when I came within about 20 rods of the road, I could see men and horses slipping along in the clouds like shadows. And when I came nearer, it was like a steady stream of horses and their riders. Scarcely a horse more than his length behind another, all of a lather and some with sweat. We went down with the stream. I heard no man speak a word all the way, three miles, but everyone pressing forward in great haste. And when we got down to the old meeting house, there was a great multitude. It was said to be three or 4,000 people assembled together. We got off from our horses and shook off the dust. And the ministers were then coming to the meeting house I turned and looked toward the great river and saw ferry boats running swift forward and backward, bringing over loads of people. The oars rode nimble and quick. Everything, men, horses, and boats, all seemed to be struggling for life. The land and the banks over the river looked black with peoples and horses. All along the 12 miles, I saw no man at work in his field, but all seemed 
to be gone. Again, that's uh, something we can hardly conceive of today, but it basically emptied the fields for miles around as people were coming to hear Whitfield preach the gospel. It was, again, more than just a novelty, more than just going to, uh, to England, you know, to go visit uh, the Metropolitan Tabernacle pulpit to hear Spurgeon preach like a tourist attraction. Uh, people were coming to hear the gospel because the Lord was saving, and the Lord put this desire in their hearts, uh, earnestly wanting to hear the things of the Lord. Now, things just got um, greater from here. The revival intensifies. This was really only the beginning of the Lord's work. Spiritual concern continued to increase at Northampton. Edwards writes, Immediately after this, the minds of the people in general appeared more engaged in religion, showing a greater forwardness to make religion the subject of their conversation, and to meet frequently for religious purposes, and to embrace all opportunities to hear the word preached. The revival at first appeared chiefly among professors and those that had entertained hope that they were in a state of salvation to whom Mr. Whitfield chiefly addressed himself. But in a very short time, there appeared an awakening and deep concern among some young persons that looked upon themselves in a Christless state. And there were some hopeful appearances of conversion. And some professors were greatly revived. In about a month or six weeks, there was a great attention in the town both as to the revival of professors and the awakening of others. By the middle of December, a considerable work of God appeared among those that were very young, and the revival of religion continued to increase so that in the spring, an engagedness of spirit about the things of religion was become very general amongst young people and children, and religious subjects almost wholly took up their conversation when they were together. Again, this is something that we would hope would happen among us as adults, but this was happening among the youth and among the children. Now, this work continued throughout 1741. Sometimes those who heard the word of God preached were so overwhelmed by the glory of divine things that their strength was literally overcome. Apparently, they had no meetings at night, but sometimes the people were so overcome by the earlier meetings uh, whether they be in the morning or afternoon, that they basically couldn't go home and spent the entire evening and night in those places. Now, the work reached its height in August and September. Edwards writes, there was an appearance of a glorious progress of the work of God upon the hearts of sinners in conviction and conversion this summer and autumn. And great numbers, I think we have reason to hope, were brought savingly home to Christ. Perhaps one of the most encouraging things uh, to Edwards was the effect that the gospel was having upon the youth in that town. On one occasion, he gathered together those who were under 17 and spoke to them in a way that left them greatly affected. And the same continued for several meetings, but the effect, he says, varied. He writes, in many they appeared indeed but childish affections, and in a day or two would leave them as they were before. Others were deeply impressed. Their convictions took fast hold of them and abode by them. There were also those who seemed to be entirely passed over by the work of the Spirit. Uh, Murray writes that those who were already grown up at the time of the work of the Spirit in 1735 and who had witnessed that revival without coming to the obedience of faith seem now to be almost wholly passed over and let alone. It was a new generation that Edwards, uh, principally, says Edwards, which was now brought in. He says, now we had the most wonderful work among children that ever was in Northampton. Many of all ages partook of it, but yet in this respect, it was more general on those that were of the younger sort. Now, if there's anything that sort of stands out in the history of the, of the Great Awakening of this particular revival, it is the sermon that Jonathan Edwards preached at Enfield, Connecticut, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Now, what happens is at this time, uh, the revival continues to spread outside of New England, actually throughout New England and the middle colonies and so forth. But there are many pastors who begin to ask for Edwards' help <laughs> 
And Edwards, of course, wanting to do everything he could to promote the revival, gave them that help. The demand for preaching, even where Edwards was, was so high that he himself could not meet all those needs. But these calls for help were continually coming to him throughout the summer of 1741 as New England pastors witnessed what they had never seen before. Benjamin Trumbull writes, there began a very great and general concern among the people for the salvation of their souls. The awakening was, was more general and extraordinary than any ever before known. Murray writes, in April of 1741, after three remarkable months in New England, Gilbert Tennant informed Whitfield of more than 20 places known to him to which the revival extended, including Boston itself, where there were many hundreds, if not thousands, as some have judged, under sole concern. Thomas Prince wrote this, the more we prayed and preached, the more enlarged were our hearts and the more delightful the employment or the work. And oh, how many, how serious and attentive were our hearers. Now was such a time as we never knew. The Reverend Mr. Cooper was wont to say that more came to him in one week in deep concern about their souls than in the whole 24 years of his preceding ministry. I can also say the same as to the numbers who repaired to me. By Mr. Cooper's letter to his friend in Scotland, it appears he has had about 600 different persons in three months' time. And Mr. Webb informed me he has had in the same space about 1,000. That's amazing, the amount, especially when you consider the population density, is certainly less than it is today. And though we may see megachurches being built, true conversion is a relatively rare thing. At this time, thousands were concerned, and undoubtedly thousands were also being converted. Now, as the summer came, no one could keep track of the number of places affected by the revival. Churches that were cold and dry at the beginning of the year were transformed before the end. Edwards wrote, it is astonishing to see the alteration that there is in some towns where before there was but little appearance of religion. And of course, churches continued to grow in membership. In some places, interest and concern appeared gradually. And in other places, the change was sudden. One of Jonathan, or excuse me, one of Edward's students, and by the way, in those days, uh, see, Edwards was, at this time, he was not uh, a professor, a teacher. He did actually take up the presidency of uh, Princeton, I believe it was. And, uh, only survived for a couple of months before he was killed by the uh, smallpox and the epidemic. But in those days, after a uh, seminarian would graduate uh, from uh, you know, the seminary, basically getting, uh, getting a master's of, uh, of arts and religion, uh, he would go to live with a local minister and perhaps spend a year with him uh, while he was learning how to minister and basically being refined in those particular skills that the pastor needed. One of Edward's students, Jonathan Parsons, while preaching at Lyme on May the 14th, 1741, wrote this, many had their countenances changed. Great numbers cried out aloud in the anguish of their souls. Several stout men fell as though a cannon had been discharged and a ball had made its way through their hearts. Benjamin Trumbull writes this, there was in the minds of people a general fear of sin and of the wrath of God denounced against it. There seemed to be a general conviction that all the ways of man were before the eyes of the Lord. It was the opinion of men of discernment and sound judgment who had the best opportunities of knowing the feelings and general state of the people at that period that bags of gold and silver and other precious things might with safety have been laid in the streets and that no man would have converted them to his own use. Theft, wantonness, intemperance, profaneness, Sabbath breaking, and other gross sins appeared to be put away. The intermissions on the Lord's Day, instead of being spent in worldly conversation and vanity, as had been too usual before, were now spent in religious conversation, in reading and singing the praises of God. 
Now, in the middle of all this activity, it's no wonder that Jonathan Edwards became exhausted. He was doing all he could to help other churches, even though he needed help himself. And here's where we have, again, uh, not only an example of Edwards being powerfully used by the Lord, but of his humility uh, in allowing others to preach in his pulpit and speaking uh, of them in, in such terms that he considered them to be more effective than himself. He appealed to a man by the name of Eliezer Wheelock, one of the leading preachers in the Awakening and a graduate of Yale in 1733, and Benjamin Pomeroy to go and preach at a settlement in the remote northern part of his father's parish. He wrote, if ever they are healed, I believe it must be by reviving and prevailing of true religion among them. By all that I can understand, they are wholly dead in their extraordinary day of God's gracious visitation. Now, this was, as he said, in his father's parish, but Timothy Edwards by that time was too old to do the work, whereas it was said, Edwards said of Wheelock, that he preached a hundred more sermons than there are days in the year. That's amazing. The strength and power the Lord gave these individuals. Edwards continued in his letter, Another thing that I desire of you is that you would come up hither and help us, both you and Mr. Pomeroy, there has been a reviving of religion among us of late, but your labors have been much more remarkably blessed than mine. Other ministers I have heard have shut up their pulpits against you, but here I engage you shall find one open. May God send you hither with a like blessing as he has sent you to some other places. By the way, it, it, that wasn't an uncommon thing in those days for... Um, certain ministers to be shut out. I think you understand that, um, that George Whitfield and John Wesley were shut out of the pulpits of, of England, uh, thinking that they were some kind of enthusiasts, especially uh, for their going out into the open fields and preaching the gospel. Um, I want you also to notice that Edwards, again, was recognizing the fact that God was blessing Whitfield more than himself, that he was blessing the ministry of these men more than himself, and he desired that they would come and minister to his people so that they would benefit. So he writes to Wheelock, he writes to Pomeroy, Wheelock agreed to come. Now a month later, the two men were together at Enfield, Connecticut. And Murray writes this, this is again one of the uh, most famous uh, things to come out of the, the Great Awakening. And that is uh, where Edwards preaches sinners in the hands of an angry God at this particular uh, church. He says, according to one tradition, it was not intended that Edward should preach it at the Enfield Meeting House on July the 8th, but he stood in as a substitute for another man. The district apparently was as yet untouched by the awakening, and indeed so unconcerned whether it should be, that neighboring Christians had given a considerable part of the previous night to prayer, lest, quote, while the divine showers were falling around them. Enfield would be passed by. Edwards took as his text Deuteronomy 32.25, their foot shall slide in due time. Repeating a sermon which he had given in his own church shortly before on the subject, sinners in the hands of an angry God. Wheelock reported to Trumbull how the people whom he characterized as thoughtless and vain were so changed before the sermon was ended that they were bowed down with an awful conviction of their sin and danger. By the way, if you haven't read Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, you really ought to read that sermon. It does have the effect of waking you up, especially when you, um, well, when you consider uh, the, the different pictures that he gives of eternity and of an eternity in hell. I remember that uh, John Gerstner lecturing on this one time was uh, asked, uh, well, certainly the, the question, on several occasions, didn't Jonathan Edwards in this sermon exaggerate the terrors of hell? Uh, Gerstner replied that uh, a hundred Edwards, a thousand Edwards could not uh, possibly uh, explain how bad hell actually is. It's much worse than he could have ever explained. He tried to make it as poignant as he possibly could, as clear as he possibly could, as terrifying as he possibly could and again, we'll see one of the reasons why they did this, of course, was to try to awaken people to their danger. But I would recommend that you read uh, 
that sermon. Now, there was another minister present on that day by the name of Stephen Williams, and he wrote down the story of that day in his diary. And he uses a bit of uh, abbreviations here, so let me uh, try to translate a little bit. It says, if you can pick up the story where it says, we went. We went over to Enfield where we met dear Mr. Edwards of Northampton, who preached the most awakening sermon from these words, Deuteronomy 32, 35. And before the sermon was done, there was a great moaning and crying out throughout the whole house. What shall I do to be saved? Oh, I am going to hell. Oh, what shall I do for Christ? So that the minister was obliged to desist. The shrieks and cries were piercing and amazing. After some time of waiting, the congregation were still, so that a prayer was made by Mr. Williams, I think himself, and after that, we descended from the pulpit and discoursed with the people, some in one place and some in another. And amazing and astonishing, the power of God was seen. Several souls were hopefully wrought upon that night. Oh, the cheerfulness and pleasantness of their countenance that received comfort. Oh, that God would strengthen and confirm. We sung a hymn and prayed and dismissed the assembly. Trumbo wrote that the sermon, oh, excuse me, I jumped ahead here. Let me just back up. Trumbo wrote that the sermon proved the beginning of the same great and prevailing concern in that place with which the colony in general was visited. So again, here are some selections of what actually happened during the Great Awakening. Now, things like this, obviously, we don't see these things happening today. At least we don't see them happening in our culture. We don't see them happening in our churches. And because of that, and because of the fact that many in those days had not seen these things happening, again, they were concerned that these things may not be uh, the work of the Lord. And we're going to take a look a little bit more at that next week as we look at the criticism of the Great Awakening and we see what Jonathan Edwards did to vindicate it. But uh, what should we think of these experiences? And here we're going to get a bit of... Um, uh, reflection by, uh, by Murray and some other authors. Murray writes this, the strong, sometimes even agonizingly overwhelming conviction of sin, so widespread at this date was nothing more than is common to all true revivals. Men suddenly and in large numbers are made to feel the real nature and danger of sin. Now that's uh, a very important statement because left to our flesh and apart from the influence of the Spirit, we'll sin and not even think twice about it. But when you really consider what sin is like and what it's going to cost those who refuse to repent of it and turn to Jesus on the day of judgment, if we really understood the nature of sin, we should be afraid of it. And that's again what awakening does. Now in the words of W.G.T. Shedd, a later New Englander, all great religious awakenings begin in the dawning of the august and terrible aspects of the deity upon the popular mind. And they reach their height and happy consummation in that love and faith for which the antecedent fear has been the preparation. He goes on, yet such emotion, far from being the mere general movement of a crowd, is strikingly personal and individual. In the words of another writer, one of the prominent features of the Great Awakening was that the gospel was armed by the Holy Ghost with a tremendous and irresistible individualizing power. Man was made to come forth into the light and take his appropriate place before God as guilty and accountable. The same author quotes the words of Isaac Taylor. Instead of that interchange of smiles which lately had pervaded the congregation while the orator was doing his part, now every man feels himself alone in that crowd. Even the preacher himself is almost forgotten, for an immortal guilty spirit has come into the presence of eternal justice. Murray writes, the nature of the preaching in the Great Awakening was often alarming, and intentionally so. The preachers knew in Shedd's word that it is the lack of a bold and distinct impression from the solemn objects of another world and the utter absence of fear that is ruining man from generation to generation. But they also believe that neither they 
nor even the truth itself could induce the fear which leads to life. Only a consciousness of the presence of God can make the truth preached startlingly real to preachers and hearers alike. Then the fact of final judgment can be no more doubted than if it were already present. What a youth said of Edwards' preaching in 1739 was equally true of the speeches of others at this date. He fully supposed that as soon as Mr. Edwards should close his discourse, the judge would descend and the final separation take place. Again, this is a feature that we saw this morning as we considered the work that Jesus said the Spirit of God was coming to do in the world. It's important, he says, for you to his disciples that I go away because if I go away, I will send the Comforter and when he comes, he will convict the world regarding sin and righteousness and judgment. And during revival, of course, the work he does is extremely power, powerful. But this is something that is absolutely necessary for a person to be converted. You might be able to convince their mind of certain things, but they won't sense the importance of these things unless the Spirit of God works. Now, the last thing that we'll look at, or actually next to the last, is the fact that the revival subsides. And uh, just, just briefly, 1742 was the last year of the revival in Northampton and most parts of New England. Edwards writes, um, oh, I guess I didn't put this quote in, but um, in the beginning of the summer of 1742, there seemed to be an abatement of the liveliness of people's affections in religion, though there were still some extraordinary appearances in the fall and winter. He wrote in a letter to Boston on December the 12th, 1743. To this day, there are a considerable number in town that seem to be near to God and maintain much of the life of religion and enjoy many of the sensible tokens and fruits of his gracious presence. Now, one thing that that tells us is this, that in order to experience these things, you don't necessarily have to live through revival. You do as far as how widespread it is. But for you as an individual to experience what Edwards was referring to and what these other writers were referring to as uh, seeming as though you're standing before God, of course that would be if you're an unconverted person, but knowing something of God's love and grace and of the reality of the invisible world, that's something that you should be able to experience as a Christian all the time if you're careful not to um, uh, indulge in the things of the world, if you cut off all sin, if you seek to use the means that God has given to you, a means of grace, the word of God and prayer, and if you seek also to do everything you do for the glory of God, I think if you did that, you would certainly sense more of God's presence. So again, uh, when we're talking about revival, we're talking about something that is widespread. We're not simply uh, saying that uh, things, certain things only happen during a revival, uh, except that, well, two things. It's more widespread and it's much more intense. Uh, even during times of non-revival, though, you can experience to a certain degree these things. Now, lastly, let's consider this, the causes of the revival. Secular historians look back at this revival and they believe, like Finney, that it was something that was produced by man, although Finney did, of course, leave room for God in his usual way of working through the means and believe that God always worked through the means in precisely the same way so that if you use the means of you know, preaching the gospel, evangelizing in prayer at any time, you'll get the same effects. Well, certainly Edwards and those in the revival, at least that uh, we've read about, did not agree or would not agree with Finney on that particular point. They believe something uh, extraordinary was done by God as he poured out of his Holy Spirit. But again, many have looked back who aren't even Christians and would simply attribute the revival to things that, uh, well, perhaps to the great preaching of Whitfield, or perhaps the fact that his coming was, such annou or was announced for such a long time and so hyped up that people were basically ready to, to fall all over him when he arrived and so forth. But uh, Murray is going to point out that none of these things can really account for what took place. There was really nothing, uh, no common underlying motive that caused people to act as they did. And certainly there was nothing that was necessarily common about the instruments that God used. 
to uh, bring about this revival, except, of course, they were converted men, but, but they were so different. This is what Murray writes. Those who have looked for uniform causes on the human level to explain the similarity of results have singularly failed to deal with the known information. The overwhelming effects, say some, were produced by fear and by the preaching of terror. But terror was by no means the one message by which the multitudes were moved. Witness Whitfield's preaching at Northampton and Sarah Edwards, who was herself so much a subject of the Spirit's work in the revival, gives testimony to feelings which are the very opposite of fear. It was not any one doctrine which characterized the revival, nor were the effects confined to any one group of people. Men and women of all ages and descriptions felt themselves to be in the presence of God. Unbelievers felt it with profound conviction, and so also did Christians with no less, although different, effect. Some Christians rejoiced in full assurance. Others, writes Edwards, passed under a very remarkable new work of the Spirit of God, as if they had been the subjects of a second conversion. Jonathan Parsons of Lyme wrote this, considerable number trembled in the anguish of their souls. Yet, many more began to put on immortality almost in the look of their faces. Their looks were all love, adoration, wonder, delight, admiration, humility. In short, it looked to me a resemblance of heaven. Many old Christians told me they had never seen so much of the glory of the Lord and the riches of His grace nor felt so much of the power of the gospel before. Never been so sensible of the love of God to them. They could not support themselves, many of them, under the weight of it. They were so deeply affected with it. Had not Christ put underneath his everlasting arms for their support, I know not, but many would have expired under the weight of divine benefits. Murray goes on with regard to the human instruments and the fact that they were so diverse. Whitfield's visit to Boston, New England, was well publicized beforehand, and therein it has been suggested lay a good part of his success. But Gilbert Tennant was yet more used in Boston, and he arrived unheralded and comparatively unknown in December of 1740 when the town was experiencing the heaviest snowfalls in living memory. In style, Whitfield and Tennant had little in common. Whitfield had too much action, thought one Boston minister whereas Tennant seemed to have no regard to please the eyes of his hearers with agreeable gesture, nor their ears with delivery. The contrast between Whitfield and Edwards is still more marked. Whitfield, says Ola Winslow, had oratorical talents nothing short of amazing, and he employed them so effectively that those who followed him lost all sense of rational discrimination. If this is the explanation of Whitfield's usefulness, how are we to account for the same spiritual results attending the ministry of the Reverend Mr. Edwards of Northampton, a preacher of low, moderate voice, a natural way of delivery, and without any agitation of body, or anything else in the manner to excite attention except his habitual and great solemnity, looking and speaking as in the presence of God. This was the Lord's work. The common factor among the preachers of the Great Awakening did not consist in their possession of the same natural gifts. Their dissimilarity on the human level is plain to see, and we are brought back to the same explanation. It is just as the Holy Spirit pleases, observed Thomas Prince, who hides occasions of pride from man. The conviction of the Great Awakening was a glorious work of God had one very practical consequence upon the mind of Edwards and his brethren. It left them unconcerned to proclaim success in terms of numerical results. And because they knew they could neither induce saving conversion nor infallibly register its existence in others, they made no claim even to know the results with any exactness. Edwards did give a figure in his narrative of surprising conversions of 1736, but the mistake was not repeated in his mature writings of the 1740s. He does not even state the number of new communicants, although the figure was probably around 200. Again, remembering that five years earlier, 200 or 300 were actually added to the church. That means 500 out of a, probably a total of 
780 or so people in these two revivals. As C.H. Maxson said, it was not the custom of Whitfield or the various pastors who published detailed reports of the course of the revival in their congregations to state the number of conversions. Any estimate, therefore, of the number of conversions in the Great Awakening is a mere guess. Trumbull gives an estimate for the figure in New England as between 30 or 40,000. Others have gone to 50,000, but as Maxson says, it is mere conjecture, and the latter figure is probably absurd. Certainly, the increase in church membership was impressive, but much more so was the religious and moral change which the awakening brought to the colonies in general. Speaking of this period, the cautious Samuel Miller of Princeton had no hesitation in writing in 1837, a revival of religion more extensive and powerful than ever occurred before or since was vouchsafe to the American churches. One last thing to consider is that it certainly would be a great privilege as well as a great deal of work, but again, something I think that anyone who has had the experience of being in a revival would say was certainly worth whatever you had to do to do the Lord's work because it was a joy and pleasure to do it at a time like that when the Spirit of God was filling everyone with such energy and zeal. It'd be a great privilege to live through a revival Murray writes this, that a minister in the great Ulster revival in the last century wrote, it were worth living ten thousands of ages in obscurity and reproach to be permitted to creep forth at the expiration of that time and engage in the glorious work of the last six months of 1859. That is precisely how Edwards felt in 1770, 1770, and that's not right, 1740 to uh, 1742, for God appeared so wonderfully in this land. Again, I think we would certainly feel the same way if the Lord should decide to send a revival in our time. And I think when you consider the, the, the particular um, character of the churches and of society and so forth into which the Lord sent those revivals, and as we saw, I believe um, could have been I think it was last year, uh, where J.C. Ryle was uh, describing the situation of England before the Lord raised up uh, these men to preach and um, basically how the Lord brought revival through them, that times were very dark there as well, and that the Lord often will uh, do His greatest works during the times of greatest darkness, because in the, in the dark backdrop, uh, the glory of His work shines forth so much more brilliantly. And when you consider that God has done all that he has done in order to bring attention and glory and honor and praise to his name, you can see why he would do it in such situations. Well, considering the particular situation that we are in as a nation and just the moral darkness that's all around us and also the um, condition of our churches, uh, we look, I would say, uh, ripe as well for a revival, and the Lord could certainly glorify himself today by sending one. So I think in light of this, we should pray that the Lord would send an outpouring of his Holy Spirit. Now again, we're going to, uh, next week, Lord willing, we're going to be looking at the critics of the revival and those particular things that Edwards points out as being the uh, hallmark evidences that the Spirit of God was actually at work. This was not man-made. This was certainly not inspired by Satan. This was something that God did. And I think as we consider what Edwards was looking at from the scriptures as far as what the Spirit of God actually does during a revival, then we can kind of sift through the revivals that have taken place, so quote-unquote revivals, from uh, those days to the present. Because whenever something extraordinary happens where strange things are taking place and so forth, uh, and the name of Christ is mentioned, people tend to think there's a revival going on. But yet, as we consider what Edwards has to say, we'll find that it's only a true work of God if certain things happen to be true about the effects of what's going on. So we'll take a look at that. And then in the last week, we're going to want to consider how these, these particular revivals encouraged Edwards and those who were ministering at that time as well, and as well as in uh, Great Britain, uh, they decided to, to uh, bind together, as it were, bond together and have set in, set, excuse me, certain set times of prayer. 
where they would seek the Lord to send an even greater revival. And again, we'll take a look at why it is they were doing that and uh, why they had the expectation that God was actually going to answer their prayers. And uh, perhaps also consider briefly the fact that even though the Lord may not have sent the revival they were looking for in their day, certainly in the next century, God did a very powerful work that is undoubtedly connected with their particular prayers. Well, that's, uh, that's it for this evening. Uh, if somebody would get the lights, I'd appreciate that. And we'll ask now if there's any, uh, any questions or any comments. We'll just take a moment here for the lights to come on. Ah, yes. Maureen, you had your so, hand up. Um, I was just Well, that is true. I mean, that is the way our society has gone, but it shouldn't be true of the churches. Sadly, it, it is true of the churches as well. But I'm talking about society. And right. Well, the thing is that Christi Christians are always going to be counterculture, and even though society might be going this particular direction, we ought to still do what, what's right. But you're right. Society is going that direction. Uh, Well, I suppose it depends on what you mean by role in it. Um, we, we did see, of course, in the revival of 1735, certain um, references to the Lord's Supper, but only in terms of how many people were actually being admitted to the Lord's Supper from, uh, well, from each observance, which was about eight weeks apart, so they were having it about every two months. It is true that at this time, I believe the, um, the view that Solomon Stoddard had taught regarding converting ordinances was still prevalent in, in that whole area. So it's, it's quite likely that, uh, again, the halfway covenant, I believe you asked about uh, last time, which um, in the halfway covenant, because the, the bar for membership as far as, well, in order to become a communicant member, you had to have a credible profession of faith. And to have a credible profession in those days, you, you had to uh, meet some pretty high standards. And the standards were, were so high that a number of, of the uh, children that had been born in the church and baptized had never actually made profession of faith and had never been confirmed, as it were, and came to the Lord's Supper. So they grew up, they got married, they had children, and then the church had to decide what to do with their children of these baptized uh, church members who have never actually made profession of faith and become communicant members. Well, they decided to baptize them, and that was the halfway covenant. But Solomon Stoddard decided at some point in his ministry that they ought to give the Lord's Supper to these children as well in, in the hopes that they might be converted. So I would imagine that during the Great Awakening, there was probably um, a number of churches that were also, again, continuing to serve the Lord's Supper to those who um, had not yet made profession of faith. But how largely that factored into it, it must not have been that great because I didn't actually see any reference to it, but I'm sure the practice was ongoing. 
Right. No, it's not old fashioned. We, we did exactly the same thing here. We do the, exactly the same thing here. As a matter of fact, um, just a couple of months ago, we met with several of our youth that wanted to make public profession. They met with the elders. They were examined regarding their understanding of the gospel and their own personal testimony. And then a decision was made as to whether to admit them or not. And then we received them all by public profession uh, on a particular Lord's Day. So it is considered perhaps old-fashioned in several churches, but this is one church that still practices that. Yeah. I think it's the right thing to do. Are there any other questions or comments? I remember hearing a similar story where uh, Benjamin Franklin had a friend who, um, uh, who knew of Whitfield and, and Franklin knew of Whitfield and his persuasive power. And Benjamin Franklin's friend who was going to go out to hear Whitfield said that um, there's no way that Whitfield was going to be able to move him to give money to the orphanages. Apparently, whenever uh, Whitfield would preach, he would also make an appeal that money might be collected for his orphanages. So he said, to make sure that that doesn't happen, I'm not going to take any money with me. So Benjamin Franklin records that when he was out there hearing Whitfield speaking and then he makes the plea for his orphanage, he saw his friend going from person to person in the crowd trying to borrow money from people <laughs> in order to give it to the, to the orphans. <laughs> the Lord uh, used Whitfield quite powerfully. Any other questions or comments? All right then, well let's... Um, Grab a hymnal, and let's turn to hymn number 337. Again, the theme, obviously, is that of revival, and I'm hoping that as we look at these historic accounts and so forth, that we'll be encouraged to seek the Lord for revival. This particular hymn is another prayer, that the Lord would send revival. O Spirit of the living God, in all thy plenitude of grace, wherever the foot of man is trod, descend on our apostate race. Again, this looks like, uh, certainly it's, it's post-Great Awakening, but it is pre-Ulster revival, pre-New York revival, and it's people who were seeking the Lord like this and writing hymns like this so that the rest of the church might seek him as well. That may have well been one of the causes, at least humanly speaking, one of those prayers. The Lord answered when he sent revival. Let's stand and, and sing this as, uh, as we close. And then after we've sung it, let's remain standing for prayer. <clears throat> 